So then, uh, hi again to everyone. Um, so this talk will be about heat and work fluctuations in a quantum heat engine, which is uh, mainly unpublished work done together with Timo Keremans and Peter Samuelson at Lund University. And I will start with a uh, motivation why we are interested in the fluctuations of thermodynamic observables and why we're interested in quantum thermodynamics in the first place. So very broadly speaking, quantum thermodynamics is the investigation of heat, work, temperature, and related concepts in, um, in quantum systems. So why should we be interested in this? And for me personally, there's kind of two motivations, one more fundamental and one more practical. And on the fundamental side, I think uh, quantum thermodynamics really um, teaches us a lot about out-of-equilibrium-driven dissipative systems, so we can learn a lot about the behavior of these systems, and it's usually hard to describe um, these systems or to, to figure out how exactly uh, they behave. And in particular, quantum thermodynamics uh, gives us insights into which kind of processes are possible in quantum systems and which kind of processes can maybe be performed better in quantum systems than in classical systems. Uh, on the more practical side, quantum thermodynamics promises uh, novel devices, for instance, for refrigeration or waste heat recovery or high precision thermometry. And now why are we interested in fluctuations? And for me, the motivations are actually very similar. There's also a more fundamental point and a more practical uh, point. So on the fundamental side, uh, these fluctuations, they contain very interesting information on the process under investigation. So the fluctuations, for instance, can have a quantum origin or a classical origin, but it can be very hard to disentangle these two. Um, so I really hope to learn more about the quantum behavior in systems by, by looking at the observable fluctuations uh, in these systems. Uh, these fluctuations can be used as a tool. So recently they have been used uh, to estimate dissipation, making use of thermodynamic uncertainty relations and they've also been used to uh, look for quantum signatures. And so here I've just um, given two references. Of course, there are more references, but nevertheless, I believe uh, when it comes to certifying non-classicality, we've only really scratched at the surface and there's much more that we can learn from uh, fluctuations, especially uh, fluctuations of thermodynamic uh, observables. Now, uh, in this talk, I will talk about the fluctuations in a particular heat engine. So we will now introduce uh, the heat engine that we use kind of as a case study to investigate these fluctuations. And this heat engine is sketched here. So what you see in black is the sketch of a superconducting circuit, uh, which defines two LC resonators, which can be thought of simply as harmonic oscillators uh, at, with frequency omega C and omega H respectively. Uh, then there's also a Josephson junction denoted by this X here, and this will mediate a coupling between these two uh, harmonic oscillators. And the whole circuit is voltage biased. Now, to do thermodynamics, we also couple these harmonic oscillators to a thermal bath, a cold one and a hot one respectively at temperatures Tc and Th. And then the idea of the engine is that it uses a heat flow from hot to cold to drive a charge flow against the voltage bias, uh, so that which can in principle be used to charge a, a battery. So it's a thermoelectric engine. And to get a feeling of what actually happens on a more microscopic level, we can try to visualize what's going on in the Josephson junction. So a Josephson junction consists of two superconductors, which are separated by an insulating barrier here in the middle. And here we are interested in the so-called Cooper pairs, which live in these superconductors. These are pairs of uh, electrons, which live at the Fermi energy or at the chemical potential. And due to the voltage bias, the chemical potential at the two sides is misaligned. So when a Cooper pair wants to tunnel across the junction, it needs to change its energy. And in this system, it can do so by exchanging photons with the two uh, harmonic oscillators, the two resonators. And now we impose a resonance condition. So we choose the voltage, the external voltage, such that this equation is valid. So 2EV is just the energy gain uh, of a Cooper pair, which goes against the voltage bias. And we want this to be equal to the difference in frequencies. Then the Cooper pair can tunnel against the voltage by absorbing one photon from what we call the hot resonator and dumping one photon into 
uh, the cold resonator here. And this is how a heat flow from hot to cold drives the charge flow against the voltage bias. Now, uh, an interesting feature of this machine is that the Cooper pairs, uh, they live at the chemical potential, so they don't carry any heat. Uh, supercurrent is dissipationless. So all the dissipation and all the heat here is provided by the photons, whereas all the work is provided by the Cooper pairs. And this separation of heat and work is really very useful uh, when we want to define these quantities as, uh, as fluctuating uh, quantities. So um, this sketch that I've shown you before, it is a sketch, so it has its limitations. So of course we, we don't just rely on the sketch, but we model our system uh, mathematically. So we, we start from a Hamiltonian for the system. Uh, so this Hamiltonian contains the two harmonic oscillator terms. Uh, so these A's are annihilation operators. And then there's a coupling term, uh, which looks a bit like a beam splitter uh, with these time dependent uh, phases here and a coupling constant g. Now this coupling term arises from the Josephson Hamiltonian by various approximations which are outlined in, in this uh, first paper here. And I should also note that we crucially make use of this resonance condition. So throughout the talk this will always hold. Uh, if we go away from this then actually already our Hamiltonian would break down and well wouldn't describe uh, this system anymore faithfully. And I also want to point out that this Hamiltonian uh, as a heat engine has already been introduced by Ronnie Kozlov uh, way back in 1984. And so here we have essentially a, an experimental architecture which, which implements this, this uh, Hamiltonian. Now to do uh, thermodynamics, well to do the coupling to the baths, we rely on a local master equation. So the time derivative of the density matrix is given by this unitary part here and the dissipative parts which are induced by the baths. So these super operators are given here. Uh, so kappa alpha is a coupling constant between the system and the baths alpha. And B is the Bose-Einstein distribution which is given here. And these super operators are, are given here. Now this first term corresponds to photons which leak out of the system, which go into bath alpha. And the second term corresponds to photons which enter the system from uh, bath alpha. And now to derive this local master equation, we have to make again approximations. And essentially these are given here. So this is kind of the regime where we can expect our model to be valid. So first we need kappa to be much smaller than omega. So we, we want um, the couplings to the bath to be much smaller than the frequencies in the system. And we also need the internal coupling, so this G, uh, which mediates the coupling between the oscillators to be much smaller than their frequencies. And I want to stress here that we don't have any constraint on the ratio between kappa over G. They just both individually have to be much smaller than, than omega. Um, so, yeah, I now want to outline kind of some of the key results that we, that we have at the moment. And this also serves as a, as a sort of an outline for this talk. So we'll first talk about mean values before going into fluctuations. So um, the average heat and work uh, from, from these quantities, we can actually obtain the thermodynamic loss uh, in this model. Uh, by looking at mean values, we can also look at the efficiency and we find a universal efficiency, which only depends on the, on the frequencies of these oscillators. And uh, then I will talk about fluctuations, so actually the main part of this talk. And there I will show that we can see some quantum behavior. And we will also find a probabilistic breakdown of the first law. So these kind of rather exotic features, I would say, um, the reason that they appear here is really the fact that the measurement has an unavoidable effect on the fluctuations because this is a quantum system. When we talk about mean values, we usually get away kind of disregarding the measurement, but when we talk about fluctuations, then even if we try to describe the system without invoking a measurement, kind of the, the, the measurement still somehow sneaks in and, and tells us that, well, I actually do have an unavoidable effect, which results in this, in this funny kind of behavior. Good, so then uh, let me get started with the mean values. So first I want to talk about thermodynamic consistency. So we use this local master equation, and this local master equation has received criticism um, because it, it is not thermodynamically consistent if, uh, if just applied naively. So uh, I think this is a paper which received a lot of attention. 
which states that uh, the local approach they, it may violate the second law of thermodynamics. And this is, of course, not good because we want to be able to fall back on these laws of thermodynamics. I think this is particularly important when we go into somewhat uncharted territory like fluctuations where there's there's kind of a lot of discussion and there's maybe uh, things are not so clear yet how we should really describe things. Uh, and, and then in particular, we want at least the laws of thermodynamics to be established to hold and not, not that there's any controversy there. Uh, I will now show that thermodynamic consistency for our device at least, for our system, can be recovered by a consistent use of these approximations, which are used to derive the local mass equation in the first place. Um, and so the key insight for this is that we should introduce a second Hamiltonian. So, um, so I will now talk a little bit about this. So this mass equation, together with this Hamiltonian that I've shown you before, it gives us the correct dynamics to leading order in these two uh, small parameters. So this is the Hamiltonian that we use for the kinetics, that we use to, to obtain the, the dynamics of the density matrix. And now I introduce a second Hamiltonian, uh, which I call here the thermodynamic Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian we will use for the thermodynamic bookkeeping. So this provides us with the correct thermodynamic bookkeeping also to the leading order in these uh, small parameters. Now it looks similar to the original, well, to the kinetic Hamiltonian, but we, uh, we just disregard this, this coupling term here, essentially. And this is justified because g over omega is small, so we can throw out the coupling in the thermodynamic bookkeeping. And because kappa over omega is small, we can throw out the coupling between system and bats in the thermodynamic uh, bookkeeping. So having, uh, be, having this thermodynamic Hamiltonian, we can now look at the laws of thermodynamics. And I will start with the zero flaw, which is equilibration. So in thermal equilibrium, we expect our system to go into a thermal state to be well described just by a single temperature, essentially. Thermal equilibrium here means that the hot bath and the cold bath are at the same temperature and that we don't have any voltage bias. Um, now, since we heavily rely on this resonance condition, we need to choose the two frequencies equal in, in this case. And in this case, we find that the steady state of the local master equation is a Gibbs state with the thermodynamic uh, Hamiltonian here. Uh, so this is our, uh, our zero flaw, so equilibration, with respect to this thermodynamic Hamiltonian. Then uh, the next is the first law, which is essentially energy, energy conservation. So the, uh, it states that the change in internal energy can be written as a sum of heat currents and power, which here I, I chose a, a negative sign for, for the power. Um, and then we have the following definitions. So the internal energy is now defined via the thermodynamic Hamiltonian. The power can be defined using the kinetic Hamiltonian, using the standard definition, but it can also be expressed as the change of the internal energy due to the unitary dynamics in the master equation. And the heat current is, um, as, is as is quite often done, uh, defined as the change of internal energy uh, because of the dissipative uh, part of the dynamics induced by the bath alpha. And with these definitions, one can relatively easily show that, um, that this equation holds. So the first law also holds here, but we have to use the thermodynamic Hamiltonian for the thermodynamic bookkeeping. And finally, we can also show that the second law holds, uh, which states the increase of entropy. So the total entropy production rate can be written as the sum of the, uh, of the change of entropy in the system and uh, the sum of the change of entropy in the, in the bath, which are expressed using these uh, heat currents defined here. And one can also show that within our model, uh, the second law holds. So this shows that using the approximations that are used to derive the local approach in a consistent way, we can actually get thermodynamic consistency, which means we can actually rely on the thermodynamics laws, uh, laws and we don't have to, to worry about any possible uh, second law violations. Um, Good. So this brings me to kind of the second key results we have for just the mean values, which is this universal universal efficiency that I mentioned. So um, I showed you this simple picture before, which kind of implies that each Cooper pair absorbs a single photon uh, from the hot bath. And if we look at mean values, 
then we find uh, that this picture actually describes the mean values well. So we find what is sometimes called uh, the tight coupling. Uh, so the power divided by the energy which um, which is carried by the Cooper pair, so the, the, the particles that carry the power, is equal to the heat current divided by the energy of the photons, which are the carriers of the, of the heat current. And, uh, and we can use this tight coupling equation now to uh, calculate the efficiency. So the efficiency of a thermo, of a, of a heat engine is given by the power that it produces divided by the heat current that it consumes from the, the hot bath, which should be seen as the, the resource here. And it's simply given by this uh, simple expression, uh, which depends on the ratio of the two frequencies. So this is why we call this universal efficiencies. These frequencies, they're usually easily accessible in an experiment in contrast to the various coupling constants that appear in the model. And the second law ensures that this frequency uh, this efficiency is always smaller than the Carnot efficiency as long as we operate the system as a heat engine, so as long as the power is positive. Now, this is all very nice, but uh, one can ask, where is the quantum behavior here? Because, well, of course, we have various quantum ingredients. We have superconductors. This process is actually a coherent process, uh, but we could think of a classical engine which is kind of motivated by this simple picture, which would give us the same mean values. And I will now argue that essentially this picture, it starts to break down when we look at fluctuations. And it, it's when we look at fluctuations where we really see the, the quantum behavior in this machine. So this is a, a short outline of, of the remainder of the talk. Um, so we'll first talk about heat fluctuations. And I will motivate that basically the heat fluctuations in our system it amounts to just counting photons, which are the carriers of heat. Uh, we'll talk then about work fluctuations, which amounts to counting electrons or Cooper pairs. Uh, and finally, I will come to the joint fluctuations of heat and work, which is where we find all the interesting quantum features and uh, probab the probabilistic violations of the first law that I mentioned before. And here I should also state that very recently, a very nice paper has been um, published where they look at a very similar heat engine and they look at the variance of heat and work. And in our work here, we want to go beyond this. We, we are not just interested in the variance, but uh, we want to talk about distributions of heat and work fluctuations. So, um, of course, first we have to define what we mean by heat and work uh, as a fluctuating quantity. And to this end, we make use of the fact that each photon which comes from the hot bath and enters the system, it approximately has uh, the energy omega h. And this is true uh, within this approximation, essentially, which is uh, exactly the approximation that we have used uh, so far uh, throughout. Uh, for the work, we have a similar situation. Each Cooper pair provides the work to EV. Uh, there's actually no approximation involved uh, in this statement. So this essentially means that, that to um, to calculate the heat, we just need to know how many photons entered and entered from the hot bath. So we will be interested in some time interval between time zero and time t, and we want to know how much heat was consumed from the hot bath in this interval. And this can be written as omega h times the number of photons that, that entered the system, or the net number of photons that entered the system from the hot bath. And then um, for the average values, we just take uh, the average value of photons that entered the bath uh, times omega h, and this average value, it should um, basically correspond to the definition that I've given you before. Now for work, we have a very similar uh, situation. For work, essentially we can say the work produced in this interval is equal to 2 eV times the number of Cooper pairs transferred against the voltage bias. So this means that heat and work fluctuations, they amount to essentially a counting problem of photons and Cooper pairs. So here now I first talk about heat fluctuations. So to calculate these uh, heat fluctuations or a probability distribution describing heat fluctuations, we can use of the theory of full counting statistics. Now I will not go into uh, much detail here, but it basically amounts uh, to up to identifying certain terms in the master equation like this. So this term uh, is a photon which leaves the system and goes into bath alpha. And this term will be modified by what is known as a counting field. 
And then we also identify these terms where a photon enters the system from that alpha. And uh, we also modify this term with the counting field, but with a different sign because the photon goes in a different direction. And having modified the master equation like this, one may calculate a probability distribution for these numbers, which state how many photons entered the system during uh, the time interval of interest. And now this is a mathematical pre prescription, but we can also connect this to a, a possible measurement of heat. Now I should note here that measuring heat experimentally is very challenging. And this here is an idealized kind of measurement scenario, uh, which is not necessarily what is being done in an experiment. Uh, but it has some nice features and it's our motivation why uh, we calculate this probability distribution on top of the fact that this is how one usually defines uh, how photons should be counted in these kind of systems. So uh, this idealized measurement scenario is essentially the two-point measurement scheme where one makes a projective measurement of the bad energy at the initial time of the time interval and at the final time. And then one says that the energy difference that one obtained amounts to the heat that was um, exchanged with the system. And if we do this, then essentially this measurement is um, governed by this probability distribution uh, that we are calculating in this way. Uh, what is important is that this measurement doesn't influence the dynamics of the system. So we can do this without actually disturbing what's going on. Good. So uh, now I will show you a few, well, just uh, a few results on these heat fluctuations. So first, we, uh, we are interested in the long time limit. So we want this time interval that I mentioned to be long. And in this case, uh, we find that there are no photons being accumulated in the system. So any photon that entered also had to leave eventually. And essentially, this means that we can describe everything by uh, this probability distribution with a single argument, where this Q here denotes how many photons went from hot to cold. So we don't have to count the hot and the cold photons individually, but we just count how many photons went through the system from hot to cold. And this distribution is then plotted uh, here for some values of our parameters. Um, so essentially, we, we also see that there's some probability that we have some photons going from cold to hot, which, uh, which are probabilistic uh, second law violations, essentially, because the, the photons here for these settings should always go from, from hot to cold because we're actually producing work. Okay, um, we can show that analytically, actually, that this distribution obeys a fluctuation theorem. So a fluctuation theorem here, it states that the probability that Q photons go from cold to hot divided by the probability that Q photons go from hot to cold is given by this exponential, where in brackets is the entropy produced when a single photon goes from hot to cold. So then the entropy of the hot bath is reduced because a photon leaves the hot bath, and the entropy of the cold bath is increased because a photon enters the hot bath. And from this equation, one can derive the second law of thermodynamics, which, which takes this form uh, here in our system. So this is a, actually a very elegant generalization of the second law to, to fluctuating systems, which is, of course, uh, well known, and which we here just find that, that it actually holds in, uh, in our system as well. Good. So uh, now we will move on to work fluctuations which, uh, as I said, amounts to counting electrons. And counting electrons here is uh, a lot harder, actually, than counting photons. And the reason for this is that the electron transport is mediated by a coherent process. So one can, uh, again, rely on existing theory. Uh, we can rely on full counting statistics of coherent transport, which goes back to Levitov, Lee, and, and Lesovic. Uh, and there, the prescription is also to modify the master equation with a term that includes a counting field that is here called a lambda. But this modification of the, dense, of the master equation looks very different from when we try to count photons. Uh, this I operator also that I introduced is the um, current operator, so the particle current operator. So this tells us how many Cooper pairs per unit time move against the voltage bias. Now, having modified the master equation in this way, one can again calculate a distribution. But this distribution is now not guaranteed to be positive. It's a so-called quasi-probability distribution. 
and uh, I will talk uh, more about what kind of uh, what this actually means. Uh, but first, I also want to introduce these so-called cumulants, uh, which are these objects for for different k's. And so the cumulants, um, essentially, the first cumulant k equal one is the average of this distribution. The second cumulant, the variance, and so on. And the cumulants they contain altogether they contain the same information as this uh, as this distribution. So we can also use these cumulants to characterize the fluctuations instead of the full. Uh, distribution. Okay, so the fact that this is a quasi-probability distribution and may in principle take on negative values means that it doesn't directly describe an experiment uh, in contrast to the heat fluctuations that, that actually do that. However, it still can be uh, related to an actual experiment where one measures work. Um, so for this, first we should appreciate that in this scenario there is no non-invasive measurement for work. There's no way of measure, measuring the work without, a chain, with, without influencing the dynamics. Now, if we turn to experimental motivation, so in experiments, uh, the electrical current is measured, uh, so which would amount to the power here. But since the power doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, measuring the power influences the dynamics. So then if we don't want to influence the dynamics, what we can do is we can make a weak measurement of power. And if, if we do that, then this um, experiment will be described by a positive probability distribution. And this distribution is very closely related to the quasi-probability distribution that we are calculating using this uh, prescription up here. And the relation is given by the cumulants. So the cumulants of this measurable uh, distribution uh, is equal to the or equal to the cumulants of the quasi-probability distribution with the exception of the variance, which will be dominated by detector noise uh, because we make a weak measurement. But if we can characterize our detector, if we can figure out what this number is, then we can correct for the detector noise and we can access uh, these cumulants and therefore all the information that uh, is in this quasi-probability distribution. So uh, for us, this is the motivation why we actually use this quasi-probability distribution to describe the work fluctuations on top of the fact that this is a well-established way of, of uh, looking at full counting statistics in coherent electron transport. Good, so uh, now I show you some results on these work fluctuations. So here I again show uh, the heat fluctuations in red and now kind of the work fluctuations of Cooper pair fluctuations in blue. And the first thing we notice is that it's a continuous distribution. And this might seem odd because um, Cooper pairs are, are particles. In principle, you can't have one and a half Cooper pairs. Uh, however, we can't actually count them one by one because there's no measurement which would do so without uh, actually strongly influencing uh, the dynamics. And this is the underlying reason why we actually obtain a continuous distribution that, um, uh, that describes these fluctuations. Or maybe in other words, the we in, when we do a weak measurement, then we will see a continuous distribution. So this underlying fluctuations of the system are also described by a uh, continuous distribution. We can also learn uh, some things from these uh, from from this distribution. For instance, we can show again analytically that a thermodynamic uncertainty relation holds uh, for this distribution. So. A thermodynamic uncertainty relation can be cast into a trade-off between power, efficiency, and fluctuations for heat tensions. This has been done in, in this PRL. And uh, here the power is basically given by the average uh, work or the average number of Cooper pairs. The fluctuations are described by this variance. And well, the efficiency is given by eta, and eta c is the Carnot efficiency. And we find that this thermodynamic uncertainty relation holds in this, uh, in this quantum system. And this is actually in agreement with uh, some recent results on ozonic transport. OK, so now I've shown you uh, well, a curve for the work fluctuations, for the heat fluctuations. But really, the, the most interesting uh, thing is really uh, when we look at the joint fluctuations, so the joint distribution of work and heat or of Cooper pairs and, and photons. So this distribution is shown here. It is again a quasi-probability distribution because uh, for the same reason as the, the work distribution may in principle take on negative values. Um, on the horizontal axis is the number of Cooper pairs that went against the bias. And on the uh, vertical axis is the number of 
photons that went from, from hot to cold. And now if one would uh, zoom in a bit more, one would actually see that, uh, that, that this is a discrete distribution on the vertical line and a continuous on the, on the horizontal uh, line. And here we find uh, that this distribution actually may become negative. So wherever uh, it's blue, uh, the quasi-probability distribution takes a negative value. And we find a oscillatory behavior which reflects the fact that the work production process here is a coherent process. And so these negative quasi-probabilities, they have received quite a lot of attention in the literature. Uh, they are really a hallmark of, of quantum behavior, and they essentially imply that it's impossible to measure uh, these quantities heat and work jointly without influencing the, dynam the dynamics in a way that, that changes um, heat and work directly, so the very observables we want, uh, we want to measure. So these negative quasi-probabilities here are, our, are kind of our quantum uh, signature. And now we can also appreciate from, from this plot uh, maybe what I mean with a probabilistic violation of the first law. So uh, to, for this I first want to remind you uh, how the first law looks here. So it's just the average work is the sum of the average, uh, average heat from hot and cold bed in this in this scenario. Uh, the change of the internal energy disappears here because we're in a long time limit where these quantities actually scale linearly in T and the change of the internal energy will be will be will, will not uh, increase with uh, time at some point. And for our system this actually translates that the number of Cooper pairs should be equal to the number of photons. So it's the simple picture that I've shown you before that each Cooper pair is accompanied by a photon coming uh, from the hot bath. Now, if we would expect the first law to hold on the level of the distribution, then we would expect the distribution to be proportional to a Dirac delta, which as an argument takes, uh, takes on the, uh, takes the, the first law. And also here the internal energy vanishes because of the, of the long time limit. Uh, however, here in this distribution we see something very different. So if we would uh, have this, we would essentially just get a straight line uh, on the diagonal. But we see a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, away from, from the diagonal line. So we see that the first law doesn't hold on the level of the probability or the quasi-probability here. And now one may, may say, well, the first law is something, it's energy conservation, it's a very strong uh, law, so it shouldn't be violated, not even on the, on the probabilistic level. But um, essentially what we are doing here is we are splitting up energy into two parts, into heat and work. And we try to access the work via the power operator, which doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. So if we want to get any information on the power, well then we, uh, we, we lose information on the energy. And if we lose information on the energy, then the first law essentially is out of the window. Uh, nevertheless, on average, uh, it holds. So on, on, on the average quantities, they, they fulfill this for, for this distribution. I would like to point out here a very recent paper which uh, looks at conservation laws in the presence of measurements and also has very similar conclusions that maybe these conservation laws, maybe one has to re rethink them depending on what kind of, of measurements one is actually interested in. Okay, so finally, um, I want to briefly mention uh, the measurements in a bit more detail. So I talk now about this quasi-probability distribution, but as I said before, this it cannot directly describe a measurement because, well, a measurement is not described by negative probabilities. But we can now uh, perform a measurement, at least theoretically. So we can couple a detector to the power for the time interval of interest. And at the end of this time interval, we projectively measure uh, the detector, for instance, the detector position. And here we, uh, we simulated this, and uh, then we obtain this, this measurable distribution, and we see a qualitative um, similarity between the two plots. So we still have this oscillatory behavior, but uh, of course the negative values are now gone, because this corresponds to actual probabilities of, of measuring something. And the way one can understand this is that uh, here we essentially show the intrinsic fluctuations which give us the information that is relevant uh, of the system. So, so this is all the information we need for the fluctuations of heat and work from the system. And to obtain the distributions that govern a measurement, we kind of have to convolute this 
with, uh, with the detector. So here we also have the coupling, the coupling strengths and, uh, and, the, uh, and the various uh, parameters of the detector which, which enter this distribution, which, uh, which are absent uh, on this left distribution. Okay, so with this I come to my conclusions. Um, so first, I believe that this uh, architecture is very promising for case studies for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a simple model, it's thermodynamically consistent, it, one can make analytical progress along the way, uh, a long way, so many of the results I showed are actually analytical. Uh, it's amenable to experiments, so in the Potier group in Sokla, uh, they are actually doing experiments on, on these kind of systems. Uh, so far they don't have a temperature gradient, but all the other ingredients are already in place. Uh, we have this separation of heat and work, which can be very useful when looking at the fluctuations of these quantities. It's an autonomous machine, um, so it doesn't rely on any time-dependent control, but it's the Josephson effect, which turns a constant voltage into a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And uh, maybe more for, the, for, for some of the specialists in the audience, uh, the superconductors, they may actually uh, be described by an infinite ladder in a, in a phase eigenstate. That's actually that kind of a rather standard uh, description <coughs> of large superconductors. So they provide an idealized work storage device that has been used in the literature before. <coughs> then I hope that I could convince you that the fluctuations here really reveal the quantum uh, behavior of this machine. And we found these probabilistic violations of the first law, which are which is very different from classical systems, where only the second law might may be violated on a probabilistic level. And uh, as I mentioned, for classical systems, uh, fluctuation theorem provide a very elegant way of generalizing the second law. So uh, maybe our our results imply that also for the first law we should look for generalizations uh, for systems which which. which uh, include quantum uh, fluctuations. So with this, I uh, thank you very much for watching and I'm happy to answer any questions either now or also by email. Thank you very much. Well done, Patrick. Thanks very much. Um, so there's going to be a delay before the questions um, come up on the YouTube. There's there's a little bit of time. So the, ba the bad news is, of course, um, we, we kind of... Um, yeah, we didn't have a great start, but uh, the good news is that the stream was absolutely perfect from the second time of rebooting, so um, it oh, was completely nice. con continuous and everything. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm a bit on the spot. Uh, I would have liked to, um, I would have liked to have kind of tuned in a little bit uh, more carefully because the talk seemed extremely interesting. Um, it, I just want to say thanks, uh, big thanks to uh, also to Francesca Piacicaparina, who's a postdoc in Dublin, who's always sort of behind the scenes, um, looking after technical issues. Um, and in particular, thanks a lot to Mark Mitchison as well. Um, I know how stressful it is when this thing starts to, to backfire. Um, so I've been there before a couple of times, as you all know. Um, but we, the good news is that we, we typically clean up the recording to the best of our ability. So if you want to watch it a second time, it's there and it's in a better format. Um, so with that, uh, I'll take some 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 questions from the from the YouTube chat, and 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 you can actually you you don't you can stop sharing your your screen, Patrick, if you want. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, you can use it if you want. Maybe that's actually a better idea in in, in hindsight. Um, so let me let me look 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 through the the the, the questions. So there's a question from um, from Devira Sigal. Hi, Devira, uh, and she asks. Uh, what is the effect of temperature on the joint distribution PQ of uh, PQW, so the joint heat work distribution? What's the effect, the effect of the temperature? The effect of temperature. Ah, the effect of temperature. Um, Not the effect uh, of temperature. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and to be honest, I we probably, I mean, these are relatively new results, so we haven't fully explored uh, the parameter space yet. But what I can say is that uh, the temperature difference uh, matters a lot for these uh, negativities and, and these kind of things. So if you play around with the temperature difference, we will see a lot of different kind of behavior. Uh, what I should maybe also can say is that it also if you look at the marginals, um, I mean, they look very similar here, apart from one being continuous, one being discrete. But uh, for instance, this Qness, uh, so the third cumulant, is actually different between the two. And this difference also depends a lot on the, on the temperature difference. 
Uh, so I think out of equilibrium is is really crucial here to see uh, to see this kind of, of behavior. But we do have to look into it more carefully into the different kind of regimes before I can uh, make a more quantitative statement. Yeah, so I, I've, I've got a non-scientific question for you, Patrick. Uh, we're all hearing yeah. on the news here about the Swedish approach, approach to COVID-19. Is it true? Are the kids in school and everything there? Uh, yes, so uh, daycare wow. schools are still open. You're so what lucky, is, oh, man. Sorry? <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> So, so my kids are actually mostly at home because, um, well, because of the situation, people stay at home if they have the, the smallest symptoms, yeah. and that means there is a lack of personnel everywhere, I and see. so that people still have to have their kids at home because uh, otherwise okay. they just can't cope with Interesting. With so everyone. look, uh, back to science. Um, so Gabriela yeah. de Chiara, hi Gabriela, um, in Belfast, uh, asks... Or he, he gives a comment. He says regarding local master equations, using an analysis yeah. made by Barra, I guess that's Philip Barra in Chile, uh, it is possible to show their exact consistency with thermodynamics even in the limit of large G. Uh, yes, um, I think I'm aware of the paper that, that is re being referred here, uh, but I think this is essentially a collision model. Yeah, that's where, right. That's um, right. The turning and on and off of the interaction in the collision model is actually crucial and so we don't have any collision model here we don't have to worry about any turning on and off or anything we uh, everything is is steady state and autonomous here I so see. i think I, I would like to understand the relation between these things better but uh, there is an obvious difference between the two approaches i see um another question in from gabriel landy hi gabriel how's it going hope things are well in sao paulo uh, he says hi patrick thanks for an awesome talk could this quasi-probability be used to measure the covariance between Q and W? And does it even make sense to define a covariance in this way with negative Ps? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, that's absolutely possible. Um, but the covariance is actually not very interesting here because all the interesting uh, things happen actually starting from the third cumulant. So uh, actually the variance here... Um, Sorry, uh, for the two, also for the marginals, the, they have the same average and the same variance, and also the covariance um, is uh, essentially the same. Or let, let's say if you have the, the variance, it doesn't matter if if it's the variance of W or if it's kind of the cross term W and Q. So um, up to the variance, Cooper pairs and, and photons really do behave exactly the same, and so up to the variance, we essentially have this kind of picture. It's really when we go to starting from the third uh, cumulant, where we, where we see, see a, red, a very different behavior. I see. Okay, thanks for that. Let me have a look. Um, there's another question here from Gerardo Suarez. Hi, Gerardo. He says, do you know any other models that also violate probabilistically the first law? Um, no. Uh, but I think... Now that we have this insight, it would not be very difficult to, to find something. So, mm -hmm. I mean, these first law violations, they might seem quite odd, but one can, so what, for me, what helped to understand it a lot is an analogy if one thinks about um, a system in an energy eigenstate uh, where the energy is made up by two contributions, a kinetic term and a potential term. And so then the, the kinetic energy depends on the momentum and the uh, potential term depends on the on the position. And of course, if we measure the energy, we will just get uh, the energy of this energy eigenstate. But if we try to individually measure the kinetic and the potential energy and then add them up, then we will not get back the original energy, but we will get something maybe completely different, something especially that is maybe fluctuating a lot. I see. And so this kind of analogy helped me to... And then one can really think of this as an analogy of a... A Wigner function. There are there are also some yeah. some differences. So that's not so. It's it's not a direct analogy, but uh, but there are definitely similarities between these pictures. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, are you happy to take more questions? Because I have a few interesting ones. Is that okay? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. So uh, there's one from Prasanna there, um, asking regarding the measurement of power. Can we model the coupling of the power operator to an ancilla and measure? The ancilla is essentially a continuous measurement of the power operator. 
Um, um, yes. So, so this I think this is essentially what we did here. So here we coupled the detect, uh, coupled the power to an ancilla, essentially a, a you can think of it as a as a, a particle uh, as a particle that that has some uh, position and some momentum, mm -hmm. um, and then to get from here to here, you actually have to convolute this guy with the Wigner function of this detector particle, but this is not exactly a continuous measurement because you are coupling continuously to the power but you're only reading out at the very end. So one could also um, model a continuous measurement where one reads out uh, all the time, essentially. So where one, but then one would need, one can model this having many detectors, each coupling for a very short time, and then one reads off uh, every single one of them. This one can also do, and then actually uh, one would influence the dynamics much more with this kind of measurement, but this would probably be more closely related to actually uh, electrical current measurements that are going on. Uh, our argument is that in the weak measurement limit, we expect uh, we expect it not to matter how one actually measures the the power. I see. So there's another question is uh, there, um, which I'm not sure do I get, but maybe you have a better idea. Is why is the oscillatory behavior of quasi probabilistic distribution reflecting coherence processes? Um, 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 because it's uh, essentially what we what we showed in in this paper is that one can directly one can uh, directly link these negative values to interference terms, and so when you look at these interference terms, then you will you will see oscillations as you as you often do in in interference. I mean, it looks like <clears throat> some kind of interference pattern then. So Patrick, um, so so, so that you have if if you have coherence. So Patrick, just something you know springs to mind is that like um, usually with you know with some like work distribution, distribution of dissipated work, etc. I mean, you can sort of often rewrite first moments or second moments in, in terms of information theoretical quantities like relative entropies, etc. Is there any such things floating around the place for this uh, quasi probability distribution? Uh, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I I haven't thought about it. Um, maybe it would be possible. Mm -hmm. One thing is that it seems to be rather general that one has to go beyond second moments. I see. Uh, so, for instance, one can look at different ways of how work can or heat also can be measured, and for that, for things we have looked at. Often it didn't matter up to the variance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only in the higher cumulants I see. that uh, one actually saw the difference between how exactly one measured the, the, the work or the heat. I see. So there's, a, there's, there's lots of questions, so it's really good. I mean, it's probably one of the most... Uh, you've generated more questions than any other speaker, which is always a good thing. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a question from Cyril. Uh, hi, Cyril. Um, he asks... Uh, when measuring an operator that does not commute with the Hamiltonian, the measuring apparatus itself brings energy compensating for the system energy change. Um, is it the missing term in your distribution of heat and work to turn it into a Dirac distribution? Um, that's a very good point. And uh, no, it's it's not. Uh, but I'm actually not sure what happens if you really try to make a very strong measurement. So because of uh, experimental motivation here, we. We, we did stick to weak measurements because electrical currents, they're not measured strongly. Otherwise, one would see some kind of Zeno blocking, and this this one doesn't see. So uh, currents are measured rather weakly. And if you look at weak measurements, then you have uh, imprecision. Then you, you just maybe you're just off because you don't know better. Uh, that doesn't have to do anything with direct energy. If you make the measurement stronger, then already the uh, the first law uh, gets uh, already you, you might inject energy on average so already the first law has to be modified by the detector um, how then these fluctuations I, I guess if you would then really try to also keep track of the fluctuations of the energy that you inject you would get kind of a cascading effect uh, which might be, it would be very interesting to, to look at this more, but uh, since we're focusing here on weak measurements, we don't have to worry about the energy injected by uh, by the detector because mm. it, 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 it goes to zero, essentially. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so there's two similar questions. One's from Giacomo Guarneri uh, here in Dublin, and the other also from Devira Segal. Hi, Giacomo. Hi, Devira again. Um, the question is basically the same thing. It's it's about can you explain a little more about the asymmetry of P W of Q about the about the diagonal effectively? Um, so specifically, Giacomo. Uh, uh, okay. So specifically, Giacomo says, uh, is there a simple explanation as to why the joint probability distribution of work and heat is significantly different from zero only below the anti-diagonal? Um, this is also something we are currently wondering. And yeah. well, so the honest answer is I, I don't really know. Yeah, I thought the same when I saw the thing as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of peculiar. I mean, maybe there must be a simple, in, in, simple reason for that, but it's yeah, not coming straight to my mind. I mean, so one thing, what what one can, uh, so we have some analytical handle on this, mm -hmm. which is we can essentially um, trace out uh, the sum of the two. Mm -hmm. So we can make a change of variables and essentially trace out, the, well, essentially integrate over the sum of the two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the probability distribution for the difference, well, you can think of it just as taking maybe a cut through here. It will look something like this. Not exactly, of course, but it will look like a cut through here. And because the heat and the work have same averages and variances, this means that only the third cumulant uh, is not the third cumulant is the first non-zero cumulant of this distribution in this direction. I see. And then you can easily show that if this is the case, then the distribution that you get looks like an Airy function. So mm. if you go from here to here, it will look somewhat like an Airy function. And Airy functions are very asymmetrical, uh, but why it is here and not mirrored on the other side, uh, this is something we don't understand yet. Thanks. That's okay. Um, and there's a question coming in from Geraldine. Uh, Geraldine Hack. Hey, Geraldine, how's it going? Um, within quantum stochastic thermodynamics, there is a dis discussion to call a quantity quantum heat or work when a quantum measurement is involved. I am of the opinion that it depends on the setup. Um, Patrick, in your setup, do you think that understanding your fluctuation in the first law may bring some key arguments? Um, uh, so, as far as I understand this quantum heat, this is usually this um, kind of energy injected by the measurement. So again, I would argue that to really add to the discussion, we would have to more carefully look what happens when you make a stronger measurement. Yeah, I mean, I, I maybe can add a point to this stochastic thermodynamics uh, idea as well. Of course, like, you know, there are many different ways to stochastically unravel a master equation, but of course, once you have a set up in mind you fix that unraveling right that's the sort of yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of thing right so i guess that's that's a, a, a kind of major topic of, of research and try to lift quantum stuff over um if you try to lift classical concepts over to quantum mechanics or whatever um okay um another uh, point that janet uh ja hey janet how's going uh is is making here is uh Obvious assumption, if uh, P and H commute, so then there are no negative streaks in your joint probability distribution. Is that correct? That is correct, absolutely. That is correct. Okay. Right. Uh, but then again, um, we don't really have any limit where we would get this. I see. Uh, so it's not actually something we can, we can, we, we can visualize and say, well, now they commute, now... Uh, um, no, we don't. We don't actually have this this liberty of doing so because the commutator of um, of P and H is mm -hmm. proportional to the coupling term again, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, so we, we don't get rid of this uh, non commutativity here, but it is at the heart of the negativities. I see. I see. Okay, I mean, uh, I think I've taken more or less all of the questions there. Just some uh, general comments maybe for those people who are still kind of tuned in. Thanks a lot for continually supporting uh, the initiative to everybody. Um, and also, I mean, I hope everybody's uh, safe and well in this sort of weird period. And just to say from our perspective in Dublin, we're, we're doing our best modulo the glick to, to, to bring this to the community. So please bear with us. Uh, as I said, we have good quality recordings um afterwards and for those other people that are in the audience maybe looking that have promised me a talk um at some point we'll be hunting you down over the next couple of weeks as well okay so uh patrick thanks a lot for a great talk uh thanks everybody for attending thanks for the questions and um see you soon okay thank you very much bye patrick nice to meet you finally okay
Bye-bye. Bye-bye.